What is plastic made of? Uh, that is a great question. Let me give me something. Uh, um, I, I don't know. Plástico vem do petróleo, pessoal. Plastics aren't actually able to be recycled. It has to be a certain kind, which a lot of people don't know that. Oh, wow. Where does my recycling go? I don't know. It's a black box. Who knows? I think it depends a lot on what country you live in. I've never seen in any way in Abuja where they go to dump these things. I know that it's burning, which is a very bad decision, no? And I tried to do my best to segregate it, to bring it to the right place and put it away. But there is a big story behind it, right? Because all the waste is getting dumped somewhere on this face of the earth. From the moment the day begins, we're swimming in a world of plastic. It's in our phones, our toothbrushes, our coffee machines. We wear it when we put on our bike helmets. We sit on it on our train journeys. We see it at lunch in our takeout containers and disposable utensils. And we often throw a lot of it away. But waste is by no means the only toxic impact of plastic. One of the things that the plastic industry has done enormously well is gotten the public to think that plastic is a waste problem. To think that it's our fault because we just could manage the waste better, it would all be solved. And that's, um, Absolutely not true. This is Annie Leonard, co-executive director of Greenpeace USA, who has traveled to more than 40 countries to investigate where our stuff comes from and where it goes. The truth is, plastic is a problem. Every point of the plastic life cycle is a problem. And so we've got to expand our perspective and look at the whole thing. We can start by asking some really simple questions. Where does this material come from? What goes into the production of it? And what happens afterwards? What a lot of people don't realise when they're holding a bottle of coke or wrapping their leftovers in cling film is that 98% of the inputs of plastic are fossil fuels, mostly oil or fracked natural gas. Extracting these fossil fuels is just the start of a long chain of toxic processes. And so we know all the problems with drilling, mining and fracking. So we have all that environmental destruction and human health impacts. And then you transport the stuff. So then you have all the problems we know about that. The oil spills, the oil train explosions where entire towns get incinerated. And then you take it to the petrochemical facilities where you turn this fossil fuels into plastic, adding all kinds of hazardous additives, softeners, phthalates, chemicals, um, metals. So that's another real problem for the workers who work in those facilities who have all kinds of health impacts and the frontline communities who live next to these petrochemical processing facilities. And then the public uses it and you have the exposure of the toxic chemicals that have been added to it leaching into our foods, into our bodies. And then you have it disposed of and you have the problems there with it going to dumping, you know, accumulating in the ocean or being burned in incinerators or the whole life cycle is a problem. In the United States, a stretch along the Mississippi River has gained a notorious nickname that is as frightening as it is controversial. Cancer Alley. Cancer Alley. Cancer Alley. For decades, oil, gas, chemicals and plastics have been manufactured in this 85 mile corridor between New Orleans and Baton Rouge. There are roughly 200 chemical plants and oil refineries here, and living amongst them are communities, mostly poor, largely black, who are experiencing high rates of sickness like respiratory disease and cancer. I spoke with resident and activist Sharon Levine. It's like a death sentence for us. We are dying. We are sick and we are dying. In St. James, we have a, a population of over 20, 21,000. In the fifth district where I live, I'd have to get a pencil to write down everyone who died with cancer and write down the names of people who have cancer right now. So it's a lot. The refineries and chemical plants in the area emit dozens of different cancer-causing substances, including something called PM2.5, microscopic particles known to harm human health. According to the Environmental Protection Agency's estimates, the risks of cancer from air toxicity where Sharon lives is nearly 50 times greater than most of the rest of the country. When I found out I had autoimmune hepatitis in 2016, I did my research and they said it came from industrial pollutants. Why would a whole slew of people die from cancer? It's coming from somewhere. The proof is in the pudding. 
the chemical plants are poisoning us. It seems absurd there's even debate about whether petrochemical facilities are making people here sick. Surely it's all fairly evident from the data. Well, as it turns out, the data is as polluted as the area is. It's hard to do research for a variety of reasons. Um, one is it's expensive and it doesn't serve the, the powers that be to actually document this. Another is that the communities that are most impacted from fossil fuel pollution and plastic pollution are low income communities of color. It's a population that's been excluded from decision making and excluded from care for too long. Another reason is that there's so many hazardous chemicals in all of our society that it's very hard to um, pinpoint one particular exposure to one particular health impact. What we do know is that the chemicals that leach out of plastic production, use and disposal are linked to a broad range of serious health impacts. And we know that the communities at the forefront of the exposure to that pollution suffer from those health impacts. And that alone should be good enough reason to reduce our plastic. But of course, that's not how everyone sees it. Over the past two decades, the US has seen a boom in fracking, the extraction of gas from rock through an incredibly resource intensive and polluting process. The abundance of this fracked fossil fuel, as well as prospects of jobs and investments in the region, has meant companies like the Taiwanese Formosa Plastics are looking to build a $9.4 billion chemical complex called the Sunshine Project, right in the heart of Cancer Alley. If it gets the necessary approvals, it could be one of the largest plastic facilities in the world. We're excited about the products that we'll make. It will be ethylene, propylene, polymers, and ethylene glycol. Every indicator is saying this will be bad news. A DC-based nonprofit called the Environmental Integrity Project found that if it gets operational, the Formosa plant could release up to 14 million tonnes of carbon dioxide. That's equivalent to more than 2 million cars on the road. Yet officials for the state of Louisiana say great care is taken to locate sites that safeguards communities. Regulators require an extensive environmental permitting process before construction can begin, and that plans for new plants are subject to public consultation. And for most of class, it was being announced that it was going to come in here. We had a, a public hearing, and the majority of people spoke in, in opposition of this plant, and our officials still voted the, for the plant to come in. I feel like our politicians, they can override all of this and they could stop Formosa right now if they want to, but they don't want to. They say people need jobs. 1,200 direct jobs that'll have a large multiplier. We're talking about 9,200 permanent jobs associated uh, with this project. People do need jobs, but not jobs that's going to poison you. Sharon, and others like her, have put up a fight against the Formosa Plastics plant. In 2019, Sharon testified before Congress. These new plants poison our communities and deepen the plastic crisis. Then in November 2021, Sharon confronted Louisiana Governor John Bell Edwards on a video call. I wanted to ask you if you would reconsider to stop the construction of, of Formosa Plastics from coming into St. James Parish. Well, I always take a look at new data, and if there's new data to look at, I certainly will. He didn't, he didn't know what to say, so that just popped into his head. If you get more data, how much more data do he, do he need? He need our blood? In my opinion, I feel like, I don't care how much tests we do, they're going to still deny the fact that this industry that's causing us to be sick. That's my feeling. I, I hope I'm wrong. When decisions are made about plastic, it's not a question of data and is there a magic bullet piece of information that some research could prove. It's a question of power. Too often, both resources and entire communities are deemed as disposable. In 2021, the United Nations condemned the continued development of petrochemical plants in Cancer Alley as an example of environmental racism. Numerous studies across the US have shown that black, indigenous and Hispanic communities are disproportionately exposed to higher proportions of air pollution, toxic waste sites, landfills, lead poisoning and other industrial complexes compared to white communities. Sharon, people might be wondering, why don't you move? Why should we? We, we were here first. Chemical plants in industry have billions of dollars. Some have trillions of dollars. So they have the money to buy their way in. We don't have the money to buy our way out. And why should I move and leave my neighbors here to suffer and die? 
So no, I'm not like that. It's not that I set out to do this. It's not that I wanted to do this, but to save our lives and save our community is something that I have to do. Plastic production has increased almost continuously since 1950, from 1.8 million tonnes globally to 465 million tonnes in 2018. If current plastic production trends continue, by 2050, annual plastic production will be 26 billion tonnes. That's four times more than the world has produced to date. A lot of things that didn't used to be plastic are now plastic. A prime example is our clothing. Nearly two thirds of textiles today are made of fossil fuels. You find this in synthetic fabrics such as rayon, nylon, spandex, performance wear, vegan leather. But the cheapest and most popular is polyester, also referred to by its chemical name, PET. Nearly 70 million barrels of oil are used each year to make the world's polyester fibre. On one side, that materials give some advantages and, and benefits because they can retain heat and make some products shiny and slick and straight. Yeah, probably my top now is also probably containing um, some PET. Yuyuan Ismawati is an Indonesian environmental engineer who specialises in waste management and toxicity. The problem with that is that PET contains antimony, which is a toxic chemical, and the wastewater treatment at the textile industry manufacturing uh, companies in many countries, especially developing countries, are not designed to treat or capture antimony. Another problem is that these um, plastic clothing, they shed little tiny, tiny bits of microplastics. They're so tiny, we can't even see them. Um, scientists have tested the drain water from washing machines, and there's millions of these little tiny nanoparticles of plastic. It now permeates our planet. They found it in Arctic ice. They found it in fish. And recently they've just found it in human blood. We're doing a giant chemical experiment of saturating the entire ecosystem of the planet for the sole purpose of giving a lifeline to the fossil fuel companies that really need to be transitioning out of fossil fuels. Putting away our waste for recycling has become a habit for many of us. But even that is something that the plastics industry came up with. Let me explain. Back in 2020, an investigation by two American media outlets, National Public Radio and PBS Television, uncovered crucial documents related to the plastic industry. There was a 1973 report by scientists that laid out for executives why it was not viable to recycle plastics on a large scale. Plastic degrades with each turnover, it says. It's also costly, and sorting it, the report concludes, is infeasible. The plastic industry took this assessment seriously and came up with a plan. I actually was working at Greenpeace in the 1980s and somebody at the Society of the Plastic Industry sent me an internal memo in a plain brown envelope. And it actually said in it that if we can convince the public that plastic is recyclable, we will see a net increase in plastic use, which is the exact opposite of real recycling. And so they laid out this very expensive campaign that was all over the place about the answer is recycling. The plan had been in the works for a while. In 1971, Keep America Beautiful, an anti-litter organization formed by beverage and packaging companies such as Pepsi and Coca-Cola, teamed up to create an ad that almost immediately became both iconic and infamous. It was nicknamed the Crying Indian Ad. Some people have a deep abiding respect for the natural beauty that was once this country. And some people don't. People start pollution, people can stop it. When I was a kid, the famous crying Indian ad was on television and I remember watching it just absolutely wrapped and committed to do my bit. It wasn't until many years later that I learned that that ad was actually created by the companies that make that single use disposable plastic. One goal was to get attention away from them on regulation. But the second goal was to get us to think it was our responsibility that the decisions that matter are the decisions made in my kitchen or the decisions made in the um, aisle of the grocery store. And that's not where the decisions that matter take place. The decisions that matter are the decisions made in the halls of government and in the halls of corporate power. To this day, the Keep America Beautiful group continues to focus on so-called litter bugs, prodding people to better dispose of their plastic waste, while many of its members aggressively fight off regulations that would limit their production of that waste. 
We are Keep America Beautiful. The nonprofit empowering people like you to take action every day at home, work, and in the community. Don't get me wrong, recycling is undoubtedly an effective and important way to reclaim natural resources. Metal, such as aluminium cans, can be melted down and recycled forever, which is good because mining metal is incredibly expensive and energy intensive. Glass is another material that can generally be continually reused. Paper also has a high recyclability, however it trails off after about five to seven reuses. And then we get to plastic. It's not actually technically possible to recycle plastic in perpetuity because every time that you heat plastic, the chemical chains, they degrade, they break down. So it becomes a lower and lower quality plastic. So you can take a empty Coke and Pepsi bottles and you can make a fleece jacket or a flower pot. But when those things get thrown away, they're not recycled. One of the most iconic symbols associated with recycling is what's called the chasing arrows triangle. But that symbol was appropriated back in 19 by the Society of the Plastics Industry in the US, who lobbied for their own chasing arrows with the addition of a number at the centre and letters below, to be printed on every piece of plastic produced in the US. This was known as the resin identification symbol. The numbers range from 1 to 7 and are meant to indicate general ease of processing the resin, with 1 being the easiest and 6 and 7 being very difficult. The problem is the presence of a code on a plastic product doesn't actually mean it's recyclable. And even when it does, it's generally only those products labelled one or two that can actually be recycled. The result is that many recycling plants are inundated with non-recyclable plastics and the issues don't stop there. Doesn't mean that when we understand the type of resin, it helps the recycling rate because every product has only one sign. But actually, it's a mix of everything. You can't mix one type of plastics with another type of plastics because the chemicals are different. And when you mix it, it will create a cocktail of toxics. When the plastic industry does put money aside to deal with some of its toxic impact, there's careful strategy involved. In 2019, a group of 28 big corporations came together to launch what they called the Alliance to End Plastic Waste. The founding companies included big oil players like Shell and ExxonMobil, chemical giants like Dow and plastic producers like Formosa Plastics. Together they pledged $1.5 billion to fund waste management projects. The Alliance invites you to a global initiative, a large-scale waste cleanup. $1.5 billion is not an insignificant amount. Except for when you realise that it represents barely a fraction of the collective financial capacity of these companies. And what's more, the figure is minuscule in comparison to the hundreds of billions of dollars that the oil, gas and chemical industry has set aside for the expansion of plastic manufacturing capacity in the years to come. The main focus of the Alliance to End Plastic Waste is recycling. Efforts to reduce plastic production or to push forward the development of alternative materials are negligible. People think, oh, recycling, that's what ecologists have been asking for. Recycling is good, it's green. Remember, plastic is fossil fuel. So when you have a toxic input, which is all these additive containing plastic, and you heat it up and reprocess it, it's going to be a dirty, stinky, polluting industry. So I like to tell people that putting something in your recycling bin, it's not recycling, it's putting something in your bin. You have to see where it goes. Call your local recycling or, or waste collector and ask, where does it go? And say, oh, can I go look? Tracking where your recycling goes is not an easy task. Depending on where you live in the world, it could be headed to a bona fide recycling plant or it could be headed straight to landfill. And sometimes those landfills aren't even in the same country. It's very difficult to get rid of waste in global north countries. It's expensive because it's strictly regulated. It's polluting, so there's a lot of community resistance. Um, people don't want a landfill or incinerator in their area. And so what some really unscrupulous companies and, and municipalities have done is load their waste onto a ship and send it to global south countries. There is now a United Nations convention called the Basel Convention, 
which does put some restrictions on export of waste from the world's richest countries. But what really continued was waste that was being exported under the guise of recycling. And we saw this, especially with two different waste streams. One is e-waste. Electronic waste has little bits of valuable gold, copper. It has little bits of valuable metal in it, but it also has a lot of toxic material in it. And so rather than recycle it in a sound, clean way, which is very hard to do um, here, where there's strict labor and environmental laws, people load it onto ships and send it to Asia and Africa, where it's reprocessed in really abhorrent conditions, exposing the workers to all kinds of health issues. In addition to e-waste, the other kind of waste that has been exported for decades now is plastic waste. For many years, China was the largest dumping ground for plastics. At its peak in 2016, some 600,000 tonnes of imported plastic waste were coming into the country each month. That stopped in 2018 when China banned the import of many scrap materials after it was revealed that most of it had been burned or buried instead of being refashioned into new products. Unsurprisingly, much of the waste that didn't get sent to China got diverted to other countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, Cambodia, Vietnam and Thailand, among others. So much of this rubbish is contaminated and unprocessable. Unwashed food containers, dirty nappies, mixed plastics. The sheer volume of untreatable trash is the most disgusting part of this phenomenon of waste colonialism. We call it colonialism because actually what they send is not recyclables and it's encroaching our areas. Why don't you increase the recycling rates and the capacity to recycle in your own countries instead of sending it outside. The arguments that I heard more and more from the Global North is that because there is demand for this. I said, what market? Do you think this is the market? I showed them the pictures, how the, the waste ended up in the communities. I said, this is not market, I said. Um, the market is only probably 10% of your containers, uh, but the rest of them it just create a new problem. It's difficult to track exactly how the global waste trade works, but the basic idea is this. There are companies and countries willing to pay to dispose of their trash, and there are companies in poorer nations willing to trade in that trash. Once the trash is brought in, it isn't necessarily processed in proper waste disposal facilities. Take a look at what happens in Indonesia. Plastic is either burned on a large scale or sold by the truckload to local communities. Local people, children included, cherry pick the best bits to sell to local plastic factories and the leftover piles of poor quality waste provide a cheap, plentiful and unfortunately very toxic fuel source for local businesses. But communities can only absorb so much trash. Eventually, it all gets mixed in with domestic trash in landfill. The landfills that they use is not a formal city landfill. So it's a dumping site. And then people burn it because if you don't burn it, the waste piles up. So it's just like a war zone uh, because fire here, fire there, and then smokes. And the communities protested because they affected uh, by the smokes and they got sick, hospitalized and so on. So these kind of problems do not bear by the exporters. You heard the same story also in Turkey, in Malaysia, um, in the Philippines. If the Global North have their own recycling plants, they will have to go through all the hurdles and regulations and thorough investigations and so on and so on to treat their waste properly. But in the Philippine countries, no laboratory, no enforcement. So it's very relaxed and not really strictly regulated. By mid-2018, many Southeast Asian countries followed China's lead and imposed their own bans on foreign plastic waste. It led to a significant drop in these imports, but could not completely stop the waste from flowing into their borders. Those countries then took their rejection of Western plastic a step further by sending the trash back to where it came from. However, those consignments of waste don't always go back to the source point. Ships are often redirected elsewhere. Research in 2019 discovered just 12 of 58 containers returned to the United States, while 38 arrived in India and the remaining containers were tracked to South Korea, Thailand, Vietnam, Mexico, the Netherlands and Canada. So I've followed the um, patterns of waste transportation around the world for three 
decades. And one of the things I've seen is that hazardous wastes follow the path of least resistance. The people that are managing the waste companies, they seek out communities that are perceived to lack the educational or financial or political resources to fight this stuff. And that's why you see dumps and landfills in predominantly communities of color, low-income communities, indigenous lands. You don't see them in wealthy white neighborhoods. If this plastic waste processing facility is too dangerous for me and my kids here in Berkeley, California. It is too dangerous for kids in Bangladesh, too dangerous for kids anywhere. And so we have to have global solidarity and both local and global solutions. As wealthy countries have realised they cannot keep shipping out their waste, they've had to find ways to dispose of the rubbish they produce while attempting to make it look eco-friendly. Waste incineration, especially the cases in which waste is burned and energy is produced, is often presented as a smart way to make our trash problem disappear. Countries like Germany, the Netherlands and Scandinavian nations argue that their incinerators have state-of-the-art pollution controls and emit less greenhouse gases than landfills. They argue that without incinerators, landfill costs tend to rise, increasing the likelihood of trash leaving home countries to be burned overseas in uncontrolled settings. Environmentalists aren't convinced. A lot of the problematic materials in municipal waste are metals, mercury, cadmium, lead. It's in the inks and prints. It's in plastic as stabilizer. Metals are elements. They can't be destroyed. It's, it's, not, it's actually not true that incinerators make waste disappear. They make it go up the smokestack, which means it comes down onto our farms and fields and playgrounds and schools and backyards, or you capture it in the ash and then you've got to put it somewhere else. We found more and more evidence of cancer cases in communities who live around waste to energy plants. And in some papers, we also learned that the risk for cancer from waste to energy is 20 kilometers to 40 kilometers. So they can reach a wide uh, radius. There is another, more insidious problem with incinerators. As they burn through our waste, they destroy any chance of reclaiming even some of the resources that have gone into the material we've thrown away. In effect, on a planet that's struggling to keep up with voracious human demands, incinerators are machines in which precious resources go up in smoke. And these incinerators, they operate more um, effectively if they operate 24 hours a day. To operate it 24 hours a day, you need a constant flow of waste. And that waste needs a lot of plastic because plastics are fossil fuels. And so they're really easy to burn. It's, it's hard to burn banana peels. You need a lot of plastic. So incinerators are like waste addicts. Plastic is all around us. There's literally no escaping it. And much of the plastic we use in our lifetime will live on in landfills, oceans, or in our communities for centuries to come. For too long, the industries that are entwined and invested in plastic production have been obstructing the world's efforts to tackle plastic pollution. The reality is that throwing things away more smartly or efficiently is nowhere close to a solution. Fundamentally, the world needs to radically reduce the production of plastic. It's tiring to deal with the downstream uh, issues. The real problem starts from the top. So if we do not address the chemicals in plastic productions, we are not going to solve any problems of plastic pollution. The only kind of recycling that I believe the plastic industry is really into is recycling their tired old narratives. Because for 40 years, they've been like, oh, it's recycling. Oh, it's refuse derived fuel. Oh, it's waste to energy. Oh, it's advanced recycling. They have all of these different slogans and words for the same tired old polluting products and processes that we just don't need as a society. We can do better. Thanks so much for watching episode four of All How the Planet, a series looking at the forces undermining meaningful action on climate change. Uh, if you'd like to check out the other episodes, you can easily search for the hashtag All How the Planet on social media. Otherwise, look for All Hail on aljazeera.com.